Welcome back, dreamers. Your host, Ken, here with some exciting news that I just couldn't wait to share. Somewhere in Dreamland now has an amazing new merch store filled with custom Somewhere in Dreamland hoodies, t-shirts, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Why not hop on over to dreamlandpodcast.weebly.com and grab yourself or someone else some custom Dreamland gear now. Welcome back, dreamers. Tonight, my guest is a legendary David Weatherly. David has traveled the world in pursuit of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, magic, and so much more. From specters and dusty castles to remote haunted islands, from ancient sites to modern mysteries, David has journeyed to the most unusual places on the globe seeking the unknown. So without further ado, grab your blankets. Turn down the lights, get comfy, and let's fade away into... David, thank you for coming on the show, and uh, I am super excited to pick your brain. I know that that I'm not going to have enough time to do all of that because <laughs> I know that you have so much information and, and you've collected so many things over the years that uh, I am just super ecstatic to have this opportunity to speak with you. So I thank you, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. So I know I want to get into the Palmetto State Monsters because I believe you just dropped that book. Is that right? Yeah, just uh, gosh, a couple of weeks ago or so. All right, maybe, maybe a month. I lose track of time with all with everything that's going on and the holidays pending and everything. But yeah, it's the most recent one in the uh, Monsters of America series. All right, yeah, and I that series is awesome. I I unfortunately haven't gotten a chance to read that one yet, but I've read oh, I think what is there four other ones, five other ones? Oh, this is number uh, oh gosh, uh, this is seven or eight. Okay. I, I'm I'm losing track too because because I'm actually working on another one. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, there's there's quite a few so far. I know I read Silver State Monsters. That was the one about Nevada, right? That's Nevada, yeah. Yep, and I read the one about Arizona. That's Copper State. Yep, and I read the Georgia one. Okay. And I yeah, read State, State Monsters. Yep, I read the North Carolina one, but I'll tell you what, I don't remember when I read that one. Um, yeah, so you're you're missing uh, Indiana. I've also done Indiana, Alaska, and Montana. Okay, okay, that was Big Sky, right? Yes, yes. I need to read that one yet. Yeah, so I'm up to I'm up to number uh, eight, I think, at this point. So. Man, you, I'll tell you what, you, uh, I want to I want to give you some kudos for the bu- books that you write because first of all. Very easy reads. I love that they're easy reads because so many people get in there and they start writing these books and they they make it either unenjoyable or uh, super difficult to read because I think that some people want to seem smarter than they really are, so they throw these big <laughs> words in there, you know, and it loses me, right? So when I read your books, though, I'm not like that. I'm like, oh, this guy, this guy knows what he's doing. Like he he's talking to people, you know. Like and I love that about him. <laughs> There well, is. you know, that's kind of my approach. I, I I very much take a sort of an investigative journalist approach. You know, some of my early influences, John Keel was a big influence on me. Oh, yeah. And, 
you know, that's that's very much what I like to do. I, I like to go into areas. I've traveled extensively. And, you know, I started doing this stuff in the 70s. So I, I call that the PG era, you know, which is pre-Google. <laughs> Meaning <laughs> back then, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't hear something, you know, oh, what the heck is, you know, the, uh, the Mothman and, and open up a computer or a cell phone and, and, you know, type it in and get a quick answer. Uh, you had to research, you know, you had to dig into whatever had been published, news stories. You know, we had these weird things called libraries, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and, and even more so you had to talk to people who'd had the experiences if you really wanted to to, you know, investigate and learn about what was going on. So I still take that approach even to this day. I mean, I will use the computer, obviously, you know, we all do as a tool, but I think a lot of people, even, even researchers in the field depend on it a little bit too much. And, uh, you know, doing this series, which people have really, really responded to this series of books. And it, it started out with Silver State Monsters has, as you mentioned, uh, that's on Nevada. And, uh, you know, it was, and, and that's, it was kind of funny how that whole book came about anyway. Uh, but right after the Nevada book, I did Arizona and then people just, you know, started saying, wow, you know, you're going to do more of these. And, uh, I had just get, gotten back from another trip to Alaska. I was like, you know, there's so much stuff in Alaska. So I did that as a third one. And I, anyway, since then I just kept writing them. And it was kind of it was kind of interesting how it started with the Nevada book because that came about because of a conversation and, and someone uh, just in conversation said to me, well, there's really not any cryptids in Nevada. <laughs> and, and I kind of laughed and I said, well, yeah, sure there are. And they said, no, no, there's not. There's UFO sightings out there, but there's not really any cryptids. And uh, I said, well, you know, right off the top of my head, here's, here's, you know, four or five that I kind of reeled off. And I said, well, you know, that's not, it was one of the, it wasn't an argument or anything. It was just kind of a friendly banner back and forth, you know? And it's interesting because the, that night or the next day or whatever, you know, I was, I was in my office and I was just going through some files. And I started thinking, you know, there was one particular sighting I, I wanted to reference back that I had mentioned to this, this person. And, I started looking and, and thought, wow, there's a lot of, there are a lot of cryptid reports that I've got from Nevada. So wrote the book just because I wanted to do it. That's why I do a lot of, you know, most of my projects. And um, I enjoyed writing it, you know, Silver State Monsters. And uh, then it has sort of, a, uh, it's a modern book, obviously, but but somewhat of an old school, you know, cryptozoological bestiary type of thing where, you know, I delved into these different creatures that covered really legends from Native American tales all the way up through folklore of the early settlement periods and uh, right up into modern times. And that's the formula that I've used, you know, the format I've used for the other books. And uh, it, um, I think it works well and people seem to like it. Oh yeah. I, I, I would agree with that for sure. It's kind of like a, uh... Well, you said, you know, you started looking through all the accounts that you had in Nevada and you were like, wow, it's kind of like when you go to move and you've lived somewhere for a long time and you go to actually start packing stuff up and you're like, wow, I have more junk than I thought I had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, when you, when you've done something as long as you have, you, you tend to accumulate uh, tons of stories and, and, and all kinds of neat little things and, most of the time you probably forget more than you than you actually uh retain because there's so much information out there there's a lot i tell you especially especially now that people are more willing to come forward with their with their uh you know reports and their encounters and beyond that of course you know years of hearing personal accounts and digging into, you know, old newspapers and, and books and everything else. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to sort out. That's for sure. Yeah. And, you know, uh, any, any given state, it always has some in, intriguing and unique legends, uh, that come along along the way. Uh, so with the series, I've, I've been trying to highlight on the cover, 
usually a creature that is kind of distinctive to the state in some way. Um, you know, early on when I when I first did Silver State Monsters, uh, Sam Sheeran, the cover artist, you know, I told him that I wanted Tahoe Tessie on the front. And I, I said, you know, I said, if you do a full wraparound cover, I said, hide Bigfoot back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so so every one of the books, if you look on the back cover, there's a Sasquatch back there somewhere. And then oh, that's uh, awesome. And then usually and then usually one of the other cryptids that is, is found in the state, too. I didn't know that. I'm going to have to go back and look now. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I I felt that way. You were you were mentioning about the the guy saying that there weren't any cryptids in Nevada. I I felt that same exact way when I moved down here to South Carolina from Ohio because Ohio is so super rich in in all kinds of cryptids and uh, you know stories and uh, I knew them all basically. And when I moved down here, I was, I kind of felt left down because I'm like, oh, they have lizard man and ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I started digging more, I'm like, well, wait a minute. There's, there's a little bit more, more here, you know? Sure. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited uh, to talk to you about that. I know that I want to, I want, I do want to pick your brain about something very special though. And I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it or tired of talking about it, but I know that you are the black eyed kids, Superman, right? You know, you know, all <laughs> kinds of stuff about them. And I had an experience. So I want to ask you a few questions. Uh, you had an experience with them? I did. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was very bizarre. So, uh, I guess the question is, I don't even know if my audience really knows what black eyed kids are because I've never talked about them on the show. Cause so could you like run down real quick and explain kind of what they are? Yeah. Well, the, the short version is that, uh, the, I'm, I'm surprised when anybody hasn't heard about this phenomenon at this point that they, the truth, right. uh, because it intrigues a lot of people. Uh, this is, <clears throat> This is a a series of accounts that a lot of people think are completely modern because they started um, purportedly with a gentleman named Brian Bethel in Texas in the late 90s, uh, who had an experience where he ran into these two kids that uh, made him uh, essentially made the flight response kick in during his interaction with them. and. They were unusual, quote, children. They had very uh, pale skin, and they had solid black eyes. And what happened was that Bethel posted his account online. He used an acronym, B-E-K, which is Black Eyed Kids. And the name kind of stuck. So I became interested in the phenomenon when I heard it started talking to people who said that they had encountered these, these things. I don't, I don't believe they're children at all but they appear to be children. And I, I got interested in it and decided to research it and I ended up writing a book back in 20, uh, oh gosh, uh, the original publication came out in 2012, I think it was, I, I lose track. I think it was 2012, the first book came out. But I had researched it, you know, years previous to that and found that really there's a, a pretty long history of sightings of these things. and. Typically what happens in an encounter is that someone will be approached by a child or sometimes more than one. Uh, often these kids show up at people's doors, uh, whether that's a door to their home or gosh, a hotel room door or you know the door to a business. Uh, sometimes they'll approach cars in parking lots and they don't initially make contact. They will start talking to the person and they'll say very strange things. You know, they'll say, I, I, you know, we need a ride home, you know, Mr. Can you take us home? And uh, these are strangers. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's obviously an uncomfortable situation from the get go. Uh, the children appear to range anywhere from, oh, you know, 10 years or so up into the early to mid teens. And as the, encounter unfolds, the victim grows more and more nervous, uh, and they end up 
looking closely at these children and making eye contact, and they realize that these kids have solid black eyes, which causes the flight response to kick in, and the victim slams the door or runs away or gets, you know, gets away from these, whatever these are, as quickly as they can. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's a, a classic BEK encounter. Yeah, they're they're uh, very very interesting, and it's something that I've been very interested in, and uh, I really got interested in it after my own encounter. I had an encounter where uh, I was actually in Ohio, and it was it was just getting dark outside. Um, I was shoveling the driveway, and uh, I had headphones on. Believe it or not, David. So the one question I want to ask you is. When these things actually communicate, have you ever heard of them communicating, not verbally, but other ways? Uh, there are some accounts of okay. those, uh, those types of things. There's, <clears throat> there's a few sort of wild cards that come in in these accounts. You know, typically, the reports are fairly straightforward. You know, the kids showed up. They, uh, there's always quirky things. Like, for instance, they'll never use a doorbell. You know, they always knock. And it's always just this long, uh, persistent knocking you know, until someone opens the door. Uh, so it's it's not normal social behavior, in other words. And they will uh, typically make some kind of request. Now, I have had a few reports wherein people believe that the children were trying to exert some kind of mind control or hypnotism on them. And I, I've heard a couple of reports, at least, where the people say that they didn't see the kids talking, but they could hear them talking. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what you're you're implying with this case. But I mean, you can you know you can talk about your encounter. Yeah, it it was strange. Like I said, it was just getting dark. I was shoveling. No one else was home but me. I was shoveling the driveway because it had just snowed a crap ton, as it does in Ohio, and. Uh, shoveling the snow had my headphones on and i hear hey mister and i'm like what so i take my headphone out because i thought it was you know somebody was saying something to me and when i turned around to to look i obviously looked around there was a, a kid standing down at the end of my driveway with he had a black hoodie on he had white hair and he was very pale and he almost looked asian um and he said Hey, mister, uh, can I have a drink of water? I'm, I'm sweating. And I'm like, it's like 22 <laughs> yeah. degrees out here. What do you mean? I said, that's exactly what I said. It's 22 degrees. What do you mean you're sweating and you're wearing a hoodie? Like, that's all you had, like hoodie and jeans on. Um, right. And it, I mean, it creeped me out. Like, I'm like, what do you, what do you want? What are you doing? And that's all he kept saying was, will you, will you let me in to get a drink of water? Will you let me get a drink of water? And I'm like, no, go away. To the point where I went in, shut the garage door, and went in the house. And he it never knocked anything like that, but it gave me the literally the willies. And that's pretty rough to do on me. It's pretty hard to do for me. It it was more than just being scared. It was this really deep, like weird. Like, I was really worried for myself at that point. And then I was worried that, that the kids would be coming home and my wife would be coming home. And I'm like, what? You know, I don't, I don't even know what happened. But that was the last I ever seen of it. I, it could have been, listen, David, it could have been just a, a crazy kid in the neighborhood acting silly. But uh, what got me interested was I started thinking, you know, that's a lot like the Black Eyed Kids experiences. and. I didn't really get a good look at the eyes because he was down at the end of the driveway and I wasn't going down that way. And I was probably oh, 50, 60 feet from him. But uh, it just the whole thing was weird because uh, he had the hoodie on. He had white hair, very pale, looked Asian and uh, didn't I didn't want anything to do with it. That was enough for me, man. It freaked me out. Yeah. So and, that, and that's all very, you know, typical of the common. Uh, encounter with these black eyed children because what I hear time and time again is people feeling mm-hmm. disturbed. You know, I, I've heard people use phrases such as, uh, 
you know, they felt like they were being, they were in the presence of a predator or that they were being, you know, uh, sized up or, you know, eyed in, in a predatory way. And the thing is, is that so many of the witnesses I've talked to have been, oh gosh, uh, military personnel, law enforcement officers, uh, people who, uh, you know, even like yourself being a martial artist, you develop a certain, uh, extra sense, you know, a, a, an additional set of warning signs sure. that you are able to detect, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a police officer that's in a dangerous situation or, you know, a martial art, artist who's in the ring, it starts to develop a sense of what kind of, you know, attack is coming or, or what to prepare for. So, you know, I, I hear these witness statements uh, so many times from people like that who say, you know, I'm just not someone who is, is easily disturbed or, or uh, unsettled like this, but uh, they'll say, you know, all their warning signs were going off, you know, whether that's a strange feeling in the pit of the stomach or the hair on the back of the neck or whatever it is, you know, they're getting all these warning signs that something's not right. And it doesn't make sense logically, right? Because it's a kid. Right. But that makes it all the more confusing and creates this, this strange mental sort of disconnect, you know, trying to understand exactly what's unfolding. So yeah, sounds like a typical encounter to me. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it was weird because normally in a situation like that, if I was a little nervous, a little scared, I'd go into defense mode. I didn't even want to do that, David. I was like, I was like, nope, don't want anything to do with this. You know, like I'm yeah. done with this situation. Like it really creeped me out to my core and I was, I was shaken, you know, like naturally shaken. I, I, and like I said, like you said, that that's, I guess a trait and it's something that doesn't happen to me very often at all. Right. And it's uncomfortable, right? Oh, very. <laughs> when, it, when it suddenly happens, you know, because you're just not used to, to uh, dealing with those kind of circumstances. Yeah, When you're in martial arts or combat sports or anything like that, or you're a police officer or, you know, you, you kind of adapt and learn how to control those emotions in yourself. Absolutely. If you don't, then, then you get yourself in worse situations. So, right. uh, yeah, at that point, like it was, I couldn't, I couldn't get a grasp on it. You know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't control it. There was no way. And, and that's an unusual situation for me. Yeah. So have you heard of them with, with white hair as well? No, that's unusual too. Uh, you know, usually, usually, quite honestly, the people have uh, some difficulty in describing the children um, in in any great detail. Uh, you know, you'll hear a couple of different versions of their uh, appearance in terms of, for instance, skin tone. A lot of people say, well, they're very pale skinned, yep. uh, kind of pasty looking. Some people will say they have sort of a uh, a Mediterranean look almost. Uh, I've heard Asian a couple of times. Uh, so, you know, there's, um, there's quirks and even in the descriptions uh, physically in terms of uh, I, one of the things I always ask people, well, did you notice any blemishes? Mm. Uh, you know, because these are typically described as being uh, teens or preteens. Uh, so you'd expect, uh, you know, some freckles or some acne or, you know, something. No, no one ever notices anything like that. Yeah, I can't say that I did. It, right. He was very, very pale, very pasty, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, 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 that's in, a, in and of itself is very strange. Uh, you know, it's just not. It is. Normal, so to speak. So, you know, I, none, of, none of this really is. He, even the people that say, well, they look kind of Mediterranean will also say, well, they look kind of Mediterranean, but they just didn't look, it didn't look natural or, you know, I've heard a few people say, well, they, they look Mediterranean in a way in terms of their skin tone, but their, their features really didn't match someone from that part of the world. So yeah, it's, it's strange, you man. know, it's as if whatever these things are, whatever they're doing, they don't quite have the, uh, <laughs> you know, they don't have things. Line down up. to a T, so to speak. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's weird, man. I hope I never have to experience that, that one again, because I, I did not like that at all. I didn't, I didn't like it. I don't like situations where I don't feel in control. 
uh, sure. at least a little bit. And I definitely didn't like that situation at all. <laughs> and it stuck with me. You know, it still sticks with me. Well, hey, let's get into the Palmetto State monsters. I want to hear about some of these monsters in good old South Kakalaki. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few of them there. <laughs> you know, the the lizard man won the cover, uh, obviously for South Carolina, uh, just because it's it's a very unique cryptid, and uh, the whole story that unfolded around that was you know very unusual. There was quite a monster hunt that went on in the little town of Bishopville, looking for the the lizard man, and. You know, lots of fascinating things when you dig into that case, quite honestly, because uh, initially, uh, you know, people hear about the lizard man and they they automatically think about, oh, it's, you know, it's like a giant bipedal, uh, you know, like the lizard from Spider-Man or something, right? Right. You know, like a a giant alligator man or something like that. And uh, that's that's really not it's not really held up when you start looking at the cases in terms of what people were describing. That's one of the things fascinating about it. You know, this whole legend grew uh, around the quote lizard man, because that's what some of the locals were, were calling this thing because it was living in, in scape or swamp. But uh, you know, most of the cases, what they're really describing sounds like a Sasquatch. And that's pretty believable in terms of uh, the, you know, the environment in that region and the potential for a a Bigfoot to be living in some of those areas, those swampy areas down around Bishopville. Uh, the cover, you know, incidentally, people have have been really kind of intrigued by the cover for Palmetto State, and it does show the lizard man, as I stated, uh, with the tail and everything. But I, I very much turned that one over to. Sam, the cover artist, and I said, you know, we want the lizard man on the cover. And uh, we talked a little bit about the interpretation uh, because, as I stated, so many people depict this thing, even artistically, as being very much like the, you know, the Spider-Man villain, the lizard, or something similar to that. Uh, but Sam kind of took this whole thing and and did a rift on it and thought, well, you know, what if it's a what if it is a Bigfoot that is like killed an alligator and taken its pelt or something, or, you know, is, is, you know, maybe somebody saw a Bigfoot carrying a gator or something, or, you know, uh, maybe it is a lizard white creature, but we kind of left the interpretation open artistically in that sense. I think the cover came out great. It's, it's, it's nice and creepy. Yeah. But, it's, it's really good. Yeah, but as I started to to uh, elaborate on, really, when you look at the reports, people who said they saw this lizard man, they're very much describing a, a Sasquatch-like creature. Uh, even, of course, the most famous case, uh, Christopher Davis, <clears throat> a young man who was who was driving home one night and saw this thing, and uh, you know, purportedly jumped on his car and everything as he was racing away. He didn't talk about seeing a tail. Uh, he just talked about seeing this this thing, you know, the red eyes, and this thing, you know, chased his car, and it was a frightening experience for him. Uh, but, you know, he wasn't he wasn't talking about a giant bipedal lizard in, in the accounts. Uh, so, all that aside, this thing became quite a a, a strange case in many ways because. There were these reports of, of cars being damaged, and that was part of what got people intrigued and, and part of the uniqueness, too, of the reports. Uh, you know, we have these situations where uh, metal is being purportedly bitten and scratched up and all kinds of things happening to it. And when you start digging into those cases, too, those are just weird also because, uh, you know, there's there's indications that, well, you know, it could have been – or, you know, maybe it was coyotes or maybe it was some wild animal, but then why are they chewing up these cars or how are they doing this? And, you know, just a lot of sort of uh, odd pieces, some of which don't really fit together that well in the lizard man story. But nevertheless, it makes it a pretty fascinating case. And 
of course, it got a lot of media attention. You know, there was a whole frenzy about the, the lizard man and reporters were coming from all over the country, rushing down to the little town of Bishopville, uh, in part because the sheriff at the time, Sheriff Truesdale, was taking the report seriously in that he was um, aware that something odd was going on and he wanted to get to the bottom of it, you know, so he he was in investigating the lizard man essentially yeah. <laughs> and uh you know that that caught a lot of people's attention too it's it's one of the few times that law enforcement has taken something like that seriously to the extent that they you know really followed up on the cases and were looking into things and trying to determine trying to get some answers you know trying to get to the bottom of what was going on and that's that's part of what makes the whole tale of the lizard man pretty fascinating too yeah i agree and you know when i moved down here first and that was one of the first things that i really dug into was the lizard man because i'd heard you know i'd seen monster quests and i've seen shows about it and i never really did any solid research myself on it so when i moved down here i really really dug my my heels in and, and started looking into the cases and looking at old newspaper clippings and things like that and uh I came to the same conclusion basically that you did that uh, I feel like it was a, a, a Sasquatch encounter and possibly, uh, you know, it could have been green because of it was living in a swamp or coming out of a swamp. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on with that, that assessment. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another thing too. You know, I think that if you if you consider some different factors, you know, uh, Scapor Swamp is is pretty nasty area, and you know if there's a if there's a large creature living back there, uh, it's trudging through all kinds of muck and uh, slime and you know all kinds of things. So, you know, conceivably, if it's uh, if, if we're talking about a Sasquatch or, you know, Bigfoot, skunk ape, whatever you want to call it, uh, being in that region, you imagine this thing in a particular way, right? If you if you say Bigfoot to someone, it, it pretty immediately conjures an image uh, in most people's minds that's similar to, say, the Patterson-Gimlin film, for instance, you know, because sure. that's the, the uh, iconic image of a Bigfoot. Well... You take one of those creatures and you throw it back in the swamp and let it live there for a few years, uh, you know, environmentally, it's going to have to, uh, it's going to be affected, uh, you know, by the environment. And who knows what's going to be stuck in and on its fur, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, yeah, slime from the swamp, uh, maybe you know, maybe mud that gets caked on its body, uh, you know, mud cracks. It looks very strange. It can look reptilian. Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, leeway there with how the appearance can be altered just because of the area that it's living in. And that could explain some of the unusual aspects that uh, crop up in, a, in a, at least a few of the reports. But you know, really, essentially, I, I think what we're talking about, and and not to, not to try to rain on the, <laughs> you know, the the classic <laughs> lizard man thing, but I, I think that, uh, yeah, there's definitely a creature down there living in the swamp, but it's more than likely some Sasquatch that is, uh, you know, adapted to that area. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There, there are an awful lot of Sasquatch uh, sightings here in South Carolina, for sure. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a lot of sightings. I mean, going all the way back to the uh, 1800s, you know, there's accounts, there's Native American accounts in the region, and of course, a lot of modern accounts too, up up through the years. And I know that uh, a, a lot of people don't necessarily think of South Carolina right off when they think about Bigfoot, but you know, there's plenty of uh, wild area in that region. And of course, you've got places like Skateboard Swamp, you've got the Congaree, uh, which is, you know, vast areas of uh, <laughs> territory that just doesn't see a human presence on a daily basis. So right. plenty of room for those creatures to roam around. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, even in the area that I live in, you go down the road 
two miles and you are just in swamp and pine, you know, for, for as long and far as you can see. And that's all there is to swamp and pine. Right. Yeah. And that's something, you know, in that, I, that I talk about in general, in terms of cryptids and, uh, it's come up with other books in this series too, you know, that, you look at any given state, and there's typically a lot of wild area, uh, you know, because uh, the skeptics, of course, you know, think, oh, well, you know, if these creatures were out there, someone would be seeing them on a, a daily basis. You know, it'd be, we'd know they were there. Uh, there's not any place for them to hide. And I always just kind of laugh at that. Uh, you know, any any given state, the bulk of the populace is kind of clustered around large cities, uh, either directly in the city or in the, the metropolitan area. And it leaves a lot of open land and and uh, space for these things to be hiding out. Good point. Good point. So let's talk about mermaids because I heard mermaids made the the book and and I, yeah. I I don't know this story. I don't know anything about mermaids down here. Yeah, there's there's some curious legends in <clears throat> in South Carolina that really go all the way back to. Uh, tales that were brought over during the the slave trade period, and uh, there's a couple different things when you look at South Carolina. You've got legends of what are called simbies, and these are uh, th- this is an Americanized version of an African legend, uh, but essentially it's a it's a type of water spirit and the tribal people that came over from that uh, were brought here from Africa and were sent to the plantations in South Carolina carried a lot of their lore uh, with them. And they talked about these water spirits that lived in, in bodies of water all over South Carolina. And there are stories about people seeing them. Uh, when you listen to the descriptions, very similar to Mermaid, uh, there's a few distinctions in that, uh, according to their lore, the Simbis, you know, would have a particular piece of uh, uh, water, you know, a particular pond or a particular body of water that a Simbi would um, live in and sort of own. And those spirits were both a supernatural force in a sense, but also physical creatures. And it was very dangerous to offend them or do anything uh, that would, you know, cause them problems because they would retaliate uh, if, if you did. So you hear a lot of curious stories, and, and there's several in the book, some of the legends that I, I gathered about. Uh, you know, people saying that there were or simbies in particular ponds and and different bodies of water in South Carolina, and it goes right on up through a couple of other stories. There's a very famous story about a mermaid that was reportedly captured in uh, Charleston. Oh, really? And uh, <laughs> and that led to a whole. Uh, <laughs> a whole series of, of issues in the city because rain started and it didn't stop. Mm. And this story, if you if you haven't heard it, uh, there's there's a couple of discrepancies when you kind of dig in, but it, it seems as if the the tale took place. Oh, I think it was 1867. So this is after the Civil War. And uh, what happened was that it started to rain, and it it didn't stop. It it was a really heavy squall that came in. It was uh, this was in July of that year. The rain just continued day in and day night, day in and, and night, and. It, it got so bad that the city, you know, it was, bear in mind, we're talking about a period when there weren't paved roads, so we're talking about dirt streets, you know. Uh, everything was so overrun that the rats were being washed up, uh, you know, the the 
streets were just standing water. It was mud, you know, it, it, people's houses, every building, every business, everything. There was water, just water everywhere. And, you know, it was for the people of that period, it was kind of apocalyptic because, you know, this is, is almost like a biblical situation. Yeah. This rain just won't stop. Well, reportedly how the rumor started about the mermaid was that a woman uh, went parading through town proclaiming that the rains had come because a mermaid had been captured mm. and was being held in an apothecary uh, on display. and. Until this mermaid was freed, the rains were going to continue. Now, this harkens back to some of the traditional lore that, you know, that the mermaids were connected to the water itself. So in this sense, there's a, a story that the, the mermaid has been captured from the ocean and sold to this man who runs this apothecary. His name is Dr. Trot. And... What had happened was that Trot had opened sort of a, a dime museum, a, an auditorium type of thing. He was putting things on display in his museum, and he was he was getting sailors and so forth to bring him unusual sea creatures and other things. And uh, somewhere along the way, this uh, sailor reportedly brought him this mermaid, uh, which he put in this container in his store which led to the rains coming in. And <clears throat> this woman proclaiming that this apocalyptic storm had come in because of the captured mermaid led to a mob forming and marching down the street to Dr. Trout's apothecary and trying to break in. Uh, so angry and so enraged that uh, this man had this mermaid that had brought this massive storm in onto the city and that was causing so much misery. So finally, uh, the, the mob is held off and, uh, you know, Trot is there and he's proclaiming he does not have a mermaid. And finally, uh, what happens is a, a a group of men is elected from the crowd. Um, so, in other words, some of the the what would be lower class citizens or working class or whatever, along with a, a couple of the the city's gentlemen, uh, formed a committee to go into Doctor Trot's apothecary and fully inspect it in search of a mermaid. Uh, so the men all went in. They searched the building high and low. And they came back and reported to the crowd that there was no mermaid. Uh, there was still a lot of anger. They, they, they had done a ser thorough search. They searched again to confirm. Uh, once they confirmed that there was no mermaid there and that the crowd should disperse and go home, the rain stopped. Wow. And the sun came out. And Pretty interesting. The storm was done. Wow. Now, that, that's all you really need here in Charleston because people are very superstitious, you know? Yeah, there, there's different versions uh, of the story. You know, some claim that Trot uh, did have a mermaid and that when the mob approached, he had let the mermaid, uh, it, it taken the mermaid out the back of the apothecary and gotten it away somehow. Um, there were other stories that gave a different version of the creature that it was actually really small, uh, you know, so we're talking about something kind of akin to like the, the Fiji mermaid almost, which is a hoax, of course, yeah, but, yeah. uh, you know, we, we start hearing versions that are kind of based on that where, oh no, it's this tiny mermaid and, and, you know, it, uh, it was away from his home for so long that it just shrank into nothingness. So. The story is a very curious one. I mean, it was it was published in different news sources and uh, told and, and sort of retold over the years with uh, a few variations here and there. But there's there's interesting things uh, in in my book. You'll see there are uh, some pieces there from 
uh, someone who remembered, there was a woman who remembered the whole mob scene and, and uh, going down and trying to uh, see if she could get down to the apothecary to get a glimpse of this mermaid, but she was never able to get there because there were so many people mobbing uh, Trot's apothecary. Uh, wow. There's there's curious side, sidebars to it in that, you know, Trot closed up his business after the, the whole fiasco and reportedly went overseas to Europe somewhere and, and passed away very soon afterwards. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things that sort of skirts all the different lines between folklore and legend and uh, reality. Sure. Uh, something that is, is very intriguing. And of course, you know, for that story in particular, you couldn't get much better of a city than Charleston to, <laughs> to have for a setting for something like that with its rich history. I'll tell you, there really is a lot of history here and a lot of superstition. You know, we every 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 porch here is painted paint blue, you know, for instance. Oh, yeah. Like and that blew my mind when I first moved here, David. Like me, yeah. my wife and I were sitting on the porch, uh I forget where we were at, what restaurant we were at, but we were sitting on the porch and I looked up and I'm we were drinking a beer and I said, Why in the hell is this ceiling blue? This is the third <laughs> third one I've seen this week that's blue. Why? So, you know, me being me, I've got to ask. So when the waitress came, I asked her, why is the ceiling blue everywhere? And she she told me it's ain't blue. You know, that's what what they paint the ceilings so that uh, the evil spirits don't cross because the Geechee and yep. the Gula believe that evil spirits can't cross water. So That's right. That's right. It keeps away the... The boo hags and the plat eyes and all yep. kinds of other haints and, and spirits and so forth. Now, the boo hag, now, there, there's a good, uh, that's a gula legend, isn't it? That It's really big in this area. And uh, I've heard the boo hag more times than, than once down here. People are really seriously, David, scared of the boo hags here. They are. And, uh, you know that's that's a very unusual creature. It's you know the the subtitles of all of these uh, monster books are always cryptids and legends because I like to throw in a few things that are you wouldn't necessarily classify that as a cryptid, but you know it's it's not exactly a ghost either. It's it's just kind of in that weird nether region, you know, between things, and uh, you know the boo hag is. Uh, something that's that's very unique to South Carolina, although when you dig into the lore, uh, you'll find that it, it's not completely unique in terms of, uh, you know, creatures similar to that, because it very much is a a, a classical hag uh, yeah. legend, you know, a, a an energy-draining creature. And uh, essentially, the boo hag is... A, a creature that uh, is in human form that appears um, to um, its its victim, uh, well, actually uh, goes to its victim uh, when they're sleeping and begins to drain their energy. So typically someone who is experiencing attacks from a boo hag, uh, you know, they'll wake up very tired and uh, this will get worse uh, as each day progresses. So with each morning, they're more and more tired and, and worn down. And it's because uh, this boo hag is coming again and again, draining their energy at night. Uh, it's just saying that you'll, if you haven't heard it already, you probably have heard it. It's, you know, don't let the boo hag ride you. Yep. And, you know, what we're talking about is, is this uh, nocturnal creature that, uh, in some terms, will cause uh, sleep paralysis. Uh, you know, some people believe that sleep paralysis is the, the scientific explanation to explain creatures like this because you can, you know, reportedly hallucinate when you're suffering sleep paralysis. Uh, but to the people of uh, the Low Country, you know, this is a this is a a very defined entity that takes its victims' uh, life force, essentially. And there's curious things that have grown up over the years about the boo hag uh, legend and, and the lore surrounding them. So lots of different defenses and ways to deal with them. 
Uh, they are obsessive creatures, and they are uh, <laughs> compelled to count things. So, there, you know, the litany of defenses. When you really dig into the the folklore surrounding these things, the the list of defenses is just kind of crazy. It kind of goes on and on and on. And yeah. I, I tried to put a good portion of them in the book, you know. But my gosh, you you can hang up uh, uh, colanders, you know, strainers. Uh, because they'll be forced to count all the holes. Uh, you can uh, put a, a broom near the door. They'll be forced to count the bristles. You can, uh, <laughs> you know, you can um, put uh, salt out. You know, salt, they talk about different things that salt will do to Buhai. Some, some of the lore says that they'll be forced to count the grains. Others say that it'll burn them. The salt is thrown on them. Uh, there's, uh, legends that they hate gunpowder. So people will put gunpowder, uh, around openings. Uh, these creatures, they look human in a sense, but when you read the details, it's kind of creepy because it, it sounds like a, uh, a human without its skin. So essentially, you know, it looks like raw meat, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. because, uh, they have to take these skins off in order to fly. And, uh, you know, go out at night and, and ride their victims. Uh, so lots of different things, lots of different ways to defend against the creatures. Uh, some of them I don't think are real bright. You know, they say, well, you can sleep with a, a loaded shotgun under your pillow or, you know, a loaded, <laughs> a loaded gun. I'm thinking, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably not going to turn out well, but, um, or, or, you know, put one on your headboard. Uh, they say you can cut off the, you know, anything in the room that a Buhag can perch on, uh, because they'll perch on bedposts and, and such. Uh, I remember years ago, I was in a, a gentleman's house and he was sharing some lore, uh, about different, different spirits with me. And, uh, it is, his house was un, unusual in a way, you know, and I, I noticed at one point that, uh, he had the, the door to his, was really a little cabin, you know, and, and the door open to his bedroom. And I noticed that all these things in the house, they had, it, they looked like they had been sawed off just with a hacksaw or something because you know, his, his, his little kitchen table, you know, he had four chairs, but the, what would have been the, the little post on the sides of the chair had been sawed off, you know, not, <laughs> not, not in any kind of decorative way, just at rough angles, you know, and the, the bedpost I noticed had been sawed off. What were you thinking, man? What were you thinking? <laughs> Well, I, I had, you know, a little, I knew this was many years ago and I knew a little bit about the lore at that time. You know, I'm thinking this is, you know, he's done this for some kind of defense. And, um, you know, at some point during the conversation, he made a, a, a comment about, you know, nothing was going to perch in his house or, or something. I think, okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I think he got everything, but <laughs> I have an, uh, interesting, boo hag story for you I, oh great okay yeah i spoke with a i like to speak to the local people when i first moved down here i still do i enjoy talking to people and uh, i talked to this older gula lady who uh i asked her about the boo hag and she, at first she was a little you know didn't want to talk Reluctant. about it yep. yeah and then <clears throat> she told me that her her sister had experienced the boo hag and it, this this one kind of kind of got me because it was it was pretty interesting. Uh, she said that her sister spent three years in prison because of a boo hag. And I said, Oh, okay. I said, Okay, how does that work? And she said, Well, the boo hag was feeding off of her energy, feeding off her energy, and she got to the point where she was she didn't have any energy left. So the boo hag then decided to steal her skin while she was sleeping mm -hmm. and went around the town and was, uh, stole a car and was joy riding and doing all this stuff. And, uh, it, but she swears it wasn't her sister because her and her sister shared the same bed and, uh, her sister was with her the whole time. She swears. Wow. So yeah. I, I don't know, but it just, it blew my, I'm like, that's interesting. That's a new twist on it. Stealing the skin and, driving around town in a car that's really weird 
Well, it's sort of a, a modern manifestation, I guess, if you will, you know, because that's, uh, according to the lore, they do indeed steal a person's skin. And, uh, of course, you know, the old legends, uh, it's typically, oh, you know, this, this beautiful woman came into town from elsewhere and, uh, you know, she's, uh, wasn't known to us, but, uh, she turns out to be a boo hag, you know, cause there's this, this concept that the boo hag can be anybody, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, just, you know, like the old, uh, archetypical town witch or something, right? Yeah. It's often, it's often a very beautiful woman or a next door neighbor or something like that. So, uh, the, the concept is that they can steal a skin and utilize that until it wears out and they have to steal a new one. Uh, from another victim. So that's a very curious story that that she shared. And, uh, you know, you do hear what's fascinating about the Buhai stuff is that modern accounts do indeed crop up. It, it, this is a, a uh, you know, this is a, a living legend, so to speak. Oh, yeah. You know, an, an, active, uh, an active thing. And there's an account in my book, uh, it's just a brief one from a gentleman who, he was spending some time uh, for business on Hilton Head. And for some reason, he just couldn't sleep. He was having these very disturbing legends and, and you know, strange things happen to him at night trying to sleep in this room. And he said that he had never had any kind of dreams about demons or anything like that. But, uh, you know, he, he was so bothered by it that he finally it was like on the last day. He started looking online, trying to find out what he could, you know, determine. And he ran across this whole boohag legend in South Carolina. And he thought, well, that's, you know, that's kind of odd. That's where I am. And, and they're talking about this. So he, he read some of the folklore and uh, decided he would give it a try, one of the defenses a try. So he put a broom, you know, stood a broom up in the corner of the room that night when he went to sleep. And he slept great. He didn't have any wow. problems, you know, the the next day. So uh, it makes you wonder. Well, I'll tell you, David, <laughs> if there's one thing here in South Carolina that people, especially in the low country here, that people are terrified of, and it, it is the boo hag. People genuinely uh, really believe that the boo hag is, is alive, well, and these things are, are with us, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's you know it's a it's a frightening prospect in a lot of ways. You yeah. know, something that can invade. You know, these things can enter even through a keyhole. So uh, they they can get into homes very easily. It's another uh, one of the reasons that you see all the places painted paint blue. You know, True. the the windows, the porch. You know the the door frames, the window sills, and all these things to try to keep these various dark spirits out of the home True. and uh, keep the people inside safe. All right, David, it's my turn to throw, try to throw you for a loop. I got, I got two for you here. The Anderson werewolf. Know anything What's about the other one? The other one is the pink mess of Goose Creek. Yeah. Yeah, the um, the Anderson werewolf. Dang it! I thought I had you, man. I thought I had you. No, no, <laughs> I, I didn't. You know, I didn't include that one in the book partially because um, there's there's just not a whole lot of information about it, and and it's funny because I talked to several people who referenced it and talked about about it, but really didn't have anything substantial, you know, and, and I kind of yeah. debated. There was there was a couple, there were two or three actually for South Carolina. And I was like, well, you know, I really kind of want to put these in, but there's nothing. Uh, the, the other one that I did not include that there's only snippets of is the Fort Mott Devil. Ooh, I don't know that and, one. And uh, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, I'm intrigued by that one, but again, couldn't find yeah. enough about it. Uh, to really do much with it, you know, it's just a whole legend that the the devil reportedly showed up at Fort Mott, and uh, you know that there's a um, 
there's lore, there's different versions of the story, but there's legends that, you know, someone read Bible verses or, or read the Bible backwards or something to expel him. And uh, there's supposed to be a rock there that has a, a strange mark on it that is purportedly the um, print that he left when he was hmm. running away from from the area. I'm definitely going to check into and, that. Yeah. I know the, yeah, pink, but the, the pink mess, there wasn't a the, lot on that either. I mean, there isn't no, a whole there was, lot. There wasn't a whole lot. I, I did include it just because uh, that one was interesting. It was covered in, in some news stories yep. back in the period. That was, gosh, that's from 19... 19- 48 yeah, it was a doctor wasn't it that it saw that and uh, yeah it, it was a naturalist okay. um a naturalist named uh, herbert uh sass who had um spotted this thing in oh gosh uh i want to say like 1928 i think because i i think it was yeah, so like 28 that this guy spotted this thing, and then uh, years later it was reported in a news bit in uh, Saturday Evening Post is what I, I found the original news story in was from uh, 48, and it was talking about this thing and uh, the speculation that it had been a giant hellbender, which mm. is um, a type of salamander. But, um, you know, it's... It was kind of a curious thing. Uh, Sass was in a boat and spotted this thing, and he tried to he tried to retrieve it. He and his wife were in a in a, a flat bottom boat. And he used the the paddle and tried to lift this thing out, but when he did, it kind of just slipped off the paddle, and he never never really got a good look at it. Uh, most of it seemed to stay in the the water, but he said it was bright like salmon pink in color and it was as thick as a, a man's thigh. Yeah. So, crazy. you know, we're talking about a, an, an unusual creature at the very least. What it was he saw exactly, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say maybe some kind of gosh, uh, you know, albino or mutation or something or, or, you know, maybe just an out of place animal because those do happen on occasion. It's, it's hard to say, or maybe something that was just a, a very rare, you know, member of a species that uh, that slipped away from him and hasn't been spotted again since then, unfortunately. That's what makes all these things fun, right? For me, is, like, I really don't want to know what they are. I kind of do, but I don't, because then it wouldn't be fun anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's what I look forward to. It kind of, it, it takes me back to my childhood, right? Where everything is mysterious and, 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 and learnable and and that's right. what I what I enjoy about this this whole thing. So, so David, when when is the uh, the Ohio book coming out, man? <laughs> You're not the first one that's asked that. So <laughs> that's a big. You know, there's a lot. There's really there's a, a ton of stuff in Ohio. There's so much. You got the Loveland Frogmen. You got, I mean, literally. Count. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of, of Sasquatch sightings in Ohio. There's uh, the Loveland Frog, Frogman is one of my favorite legends. Actually, I, I, I've i been up to Loveland and out to the area where that thing was spotted. It's just, yep. it's such a great story. Uh, the Defiance Werewolf. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got some, yeah, there, there are definitely a lot of great stories in Ohio. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I'm already at work on the next one in the series. It is not Ohio. I, I'll break the news to you now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll, 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 I'll and, patiently uh, wait it for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, at least you're not asking me, you know, there's a number of people that have asked me well, when you're going to have all 50 done. <laughs> yeah. No joke, man. <laughs> yeah. I'll get on, I'll get on that. You know, it's, uh, there, there are a lot of work, uh, in, in some ways, but, um, you know, there, I, I kind of keep people guessing intentionally, and they've also been somewhat organic. Um, you know, like I said, the, the whole thing started with Nevada just because of, of how that happened. And uh, the second one was Arizona just because uh, I, I lived in Arizona for a lot of years and just had so much material from there. Yeah. And I uh, thought, wow, this will be great. And, you know, I grew up in North Carolina, but that was um, – Gosh, that was, let's see, the, that was the fifth one I did. And I actually, 
kind of waited intentionally because it was um, it's just a lot of material there. There's a lot of creatures in North Carolina. And uh, Can we talk about that for a minute, know, just for a minute? Yeah, we can talk about it for a couple minutes. So my, my fascination in North Carolina is not the Beast of Bladenboro, even though that is a an amazing story. My fascination is uh, Normie. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I've been on that story. lake several times, and, you know, it's a man-made lake, so it's crazy that it even has stories of 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 a lake monster you know it's it's really crazy yeah 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 it's um that one's intriguing you know and it's kind of it's kind of curious when you look at it because as you said it was indeed a uh is indeed a man-made lake and uh you know that being the case you'd have to think well you know why <laughs> It's a man-made lake, you know. Why would there be anything in it at all, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's there's just a lot of reports. Um, there's a, a website that last I checked, it was still up. Uh, you know, Lake Norman Monster, and you know, people would go on and, and post their experiences and their accounts, and some of them are pretty interesting. You know, people seeing these creatures, uh, some kind of creature in this lake, and what's really kind of intriguing about it too is that there are all these different uh, uh like conspiracy theories that have grown up around yeah. uh you know the lake because or around the monster because um of, of how this thing just you know somehow manifested in this lake right and some of them are, are kind of mundane it's like oh well you know somebody uh put a, uh, you know, exotic species in there or somebody let, you know, let something, you know, that they shouldn't have on off into the water. But then you hear other stories that are talking about, well, no, it's a government experiment or it's a, a mutated animal because of the nuclear power plant uh, that's right there. Yeah. So you, know, you hear all these different accounts and you think, you know what, who knows uh, really, but people are seeing something there. And, and of course, in the in the area around the lake, they've kind of taken off with it and and depicted Normie has a s- sort of an overly friendly looking version of a, a Loch Ness monster yeah. type of creature. Uh, but um, you know what people when you get down to to brass tacks and start looking at the accounts, what people are describing is uh, maybe is a giant catfish, you know, or uh, something akin to that. Some people think it's more serpent-like or, or eel-like. Um, hard to say. You know, there's there's a lot of interesting things about that body of water because there's a lot of stuff down at the bottom of Lake Norman. You know, when yeah. they created that lake, they flooded, uh, you know, all kinds of buildings and homes and stuff that were there before. And you hear stories from some of the people who dive there and uh, explore the, the ruins that are down down at the bottom of the lake. And uh, there are a few reports of people seeing, you know, massive uh, catfish and so forth down there. So, yeah, who knows? I, I, think it's a, I think it's a pretty cool legend that has grown up over the years around Lake Norman. I do, too. And I absolutely love whenever a town or a city latches on to its lore and legends in and has big, you know, like the Mothman Festival and the Lizard Man uh, Festival, and I, I love it when they do that. It it makes it it makes it so much fun. I think, and and I think it's it's it does good for them as well. I th- I think so too. You know, and I I hope that I hope that more small towns will continue to embrace their their local legends. You know, so to speak. Uh, it's a handful of them now. You know, uh, there is there is a, a beast fest in Bladenboro. Oh, really? You know, na- named after the Beast of Bladenboro. Uh, there, a lot of these festivals are are very much oriented towards just the the idea that the the legend was there. You know, so the Beast yeah. Fest is really not. You'll see some representations. You know, you'll see the beast has a mascot, and you'll see you know like. Uh, stuffed animal type of beast, you know, things. But in terms of really delving into the cryptid side of it more, they don't, 
they don't do like the Mothman Festival does. They don't have a a group of speakers come in and, and talk about the legend or anything like that. Uh, but still, you know, there's that potential there because at least they're honoring the legend and, uh, you know, they're not, they're not ashamed of it or, or yeah. scoffing at it or anything like that. So yeah, I love there's a that. handful of those around the country. You I, know, I love this it. one is actually in Indiana. Oh, is it? Yeah. Turtle days. Oh, you know what? I have heard of that one. Mm-hmm. I've never, I've never, I should have went there when I lived up in Ohio. Yeah, it's in, it's in Cherubusco and it's um, a tribute to Oscar, yeah, the Beast of Busco, a giant turtle. Yeah, that giant turtle, man. Mm-hmm. That one's really yeah, cool. Yeah, so that's, that's actually the oldest one uh, that is named after a, a cryptid uh, that it's, uh, that still runs, you know, but again, they don't really, uh, they do all kinds of, you'll see all kinds of turtle you know, turtle type of things, you know, representations of Oscar and so forth. And actually, when you go to that town, you see Oscar show up a lot. I, I, somebody gave me, I've got the uh, fireman's patch, you know, the fire department there. It's a turtle. It's That's like awesome. A, it's like a muscular turtle holding an axe and, and wearing a fireman's hat, you know. And, uh, you know, they use him as, as their logo. And you'll see... You know, there's a few statues of, of a giant turtle around town and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the few. There's a handful of these things around the country. And like I said, I, I hope to see more of them spring up. Yeah, me, me too. Me too. Well, hey, David, uh, I really appreciate you being on the show uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk with me. Um, hey, where can everybody find your, your books and your links and your your documentaries and all that stuff. Where, where can everybody find you? So the best, the best resource online is eerie lights.com. That is E E R I E L I G H T S.com. Two E's at the beginning of eerie. You'll find links there for uh, all the various projects that I have uh, out and coming out. There's links for all the books, uh, information about, other upcoming appearances and documentaries and shows and so forth. Um, all the books are available, of course, on Amazon.com. Uh, there's the Eerie Lights Instagram page or the Facebook page. I've you know, got all the social media. And, uh, you know, check those out. Uh, again, the website is the best place for current information and what's coming up. And there's also a contact page on there. If you've had a strange experience, uh, if you had a run-in with a cryptid in your state, Please send it to me. I'd love to hear those stories. And uh, gosh, I've got uh, 42 states left to go. So your account <laughs> may end up in a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, David. Well, I really appreciate you. Uh, I'd love to have you on again. And uh, I want to thank you. Sure thing, Ken. My pleasure. All right. You have a good night. You too. Well, that about does it for Dreamland tonight, dreamers. Thanks again for listening, and good night.